Yeah, I want to return briefly to desengaño because there may be some confusion caused by disillusionment, the English word used to translate the term, which is an approximation uh, as uh, all translations are. Um, disillusionment uh, can mean in English disenchantment and disappointment, words that have a very negative connotation, whereas desengaño does not quite have that connotation. Uh, at worst, it could mean resignation, uh, meaning I was resigned to find out that such and such a person was not as good as I thought him or her to be. Uh, remember the quote from Otis Green that I uh, read you in which desengaño was uh, thought of as uh, uh, the sumum bonum, the ultimate good desired by the stoic wise man. Baroque uh, des desengaño is, 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 is a positive condition at which the individual arrives after having shed the scales from his eyes, remember, uh, and learned of the deceitfulness of appearances, of the mystifying allure of all that he has taken as being very valuable. Everything that shines is not gold, is what the individual learns, having gone through the process of engaño, that is deceit, and desengaño to put it in, in the simplest of terms. Uh, what I suggested, moreover, is that the plot of the Quixote and that of some of the stories embedded in it, in this part two, uh, go through a similar unfolding from engaño to desengaño. Uh, we will be following this development in the episodes that we will be dealing with during the rest of the semester, some of which are the culminating episodes in the entire book, not only uh, the second part, but the entire Quixote. Um, so, but let us first turn our attention today uh, to uh, uh, two critics whose essays you are reading this week in the case book. And this is, this is sort of the, uh, the uh, the highlight, or the high point, I should say, of the case book, these two essays by Auerbach and Spitzer. Now, we already saw uh, Auerbach's main thesis in Mimesis, his famous book, and uh, that that thesis is about the Christian mixture of the sublime uh, and uh, the low style in the New Testament. Uh, and how this led to the emergence and development of realism, and eventually uh, to the novel and to a book like the Quixote. This mixture of the sublime and the low style was a break away from the strict separation between high and low style in the classical tradition, which Auerbach uh, derives, uh, this idea, uh, from St. Augustine and the Church Fathers, the patristic uh, tradition. Auerbach labels sermo humilis, uh, I put it on the board, or humble sermon, or better, humble discourse. This Christian response to the classical division of styles derived, that division of styles derived from Aristotle and from Roman rhetorical uh, theory. This mixture of the transcendent and the low style was exemplified by Christ's passion, through which the drama of man's everyday life assumes the most profound meaning. Life does not end in the brief span of worldly existence. Eternity is present in the passion as a message of hope. Now, Auerbach's uh, application of this theory uh, in the, uh, to the Quixote leads him to the belief that the Quixote is essentially a funny book, as you have read in the essay, uh, The Enchanted Dulcinea, an interpretation uh, for which Auerbach 
was excoriated by Hispanists, particularly Spanish ones, for whom the Quixote was a very profound and transcendental book. Although many were motivated by a nationalistic interpretation of Cervantes, whom they saw as the highest example of Spanish genius, and his protagonist as the very representative of the fatherland, they were not entirely wrong in their reactions. What happened in Spain was that uh, the Quixote was canonized, meaning turned into a classic in the, in the 18th century. Uh, and then by the early 19th century, during the Romantic period, uh, it was exalted as the, the highest point of Spanish genius and the, the highest representative of the Spanish language in which the, the spirit of Spanishness was, uh, was uh, embedded and so forth. And uh, it became, uh, uh, this was a very nationalistic reading of the Quixote that prevailed uh, and still prevails in some quarters. And uh, so the people who held this view of the Quixote of course, were outraged by Auerbach's reading of uh, the Quixote as essentially a funny uh, book. Uh, they were not entirely wrong in their reactions. Um, it should be very clear to those of you reading the Quixote that there is a great deal that is very deep and serious in it, both about life in general and about literature. Auerbach's analysis, however, is very revealing of how the low style, particularly in Sancho and other low class characters, plays such a crucial role in the farcical episodes in the Quixote. Besides, we are not uh, familiar in the modern period anymore with this separation of styles or high and low style or anything like that. And it's very instructive to read Auerbach, uh, who was steeped in that, uh, uh, even when he goes astray in, in my view. I was criticized by some Hispanics for having included that essay in the case book, by the way, mostly because they had not been included. No. Auerbach's problem is that he cannot get out of his, of his scheme, which equ equates seriousness with, uh, only with tragedy. Don Quixote can be serious without being tragic, and in fact, this is one of its most important lessons and most innovative qualities. One of the most innovative qualities of the new literature that emerges in the wake of the Quixote. To say that Cervantes does not deal with the serious uh, issues of his time is pure nonsense, uh, as we have seen. Uh, to claim that the book is above all a farce is also nonsense. Besides a novel's worth, should not be gauged by how faithfully it represents reality if such a thing can be gauged at all. Auerbach is wrong when he says that Don Quixote's idée fixe has no contact with reality and that it only causes confusion. On the contrary, his idée fixe serves by contrast to clarify many things around him, but there are salvageable parts of Auerbach's essays, uh, essay, which is why I included it in, in, in the case book. Um, Nabokov, on the other hand, the great Russian novelist, uh, has a horrible book on the Quixote, which was a series of lectures that he gave uh, at Harvard. And the, the, uh, the book is interesting only because Nabokov wrote it, but he says really outrageous things like, there is no reflection of the Spain of Cervantes' time in the Quixote. What? Nabokov was a great writer, but not a great critic, obviously. I think that the first salvageable, salvageable thing in Auerbach's essay is uh, uh, his reaction against romantic criticism and the tendency to overinterpret uh, whatever that means, ultimately. Uh, Auerbach writes, defining his own position, the following you have it in, in, in the case book, page 58. For centuries, he says, especially since the Romanticists, many things have been read into him, into Don Quixote, which he, or into Cervantes, which he hardly foreboded, let alone intended. Such transforming and transcendent interpretation, interpretations are often fertile. 
A book like Don Quixote dissociates itself from its author's intention and leads a life of its own. Don Quixote shows a new face to every age which enjoys him. Yet the historian, whose task, meaning himself, whose task it is to define the place of a given work in a historical continuity, must endeavor insofar as that is possible, insofar as that is still possible, to attain a clear understanding of what the book meant to its author and his contemporaries." Unquote. Uh, this is the, the dream of the philologians, or the, the critics uh, steeped in philology, that they can actually get back to the meaning of the, of the, of the work in, uh, in the period in which it was writing and, and, and to discern what the author's intentions uh, were. We, we are not uh, so sure uh, anymore. Peter Russell's book, uh, Peter Russell was an English uh, Hispanist of some note. His book is called Don Quixote as a Funny Book. Follows our back and is among those who style themselves as the hard school of Cervantes' criticism, based mostly in England, and uh, whose hardness is mostly of the intellectual arteries, in my view. Just because Cervantes' contemporaries found the book funny, or just because of what Cervantes said about the comic, it is impoverishing to see the Quixote in this light, particularly when the comic is not defined. If the comic arises, as it does in the Quixote, from the toils of a mind out of sorts with the modern world, then it is a comic of the highest form of seriousness. Comedy can be very serious and profound, and it is in the Quixote. Contemporaries often misread works written uh, in their time, obviously, and uh, authors' intentions are very, very difficult to ascertain, and I'll say a little bit more about that uh, later. Spitzer, Leo Spitzer, was another great critic of the German philological school. He, too, escaped from Nazi Germany and preceded Auerbach in the chair at the University of Istanbul. Uh, Spitzer wound up at Johns Hopkins University, not at Yale, alas, like Auerbach. Spitzer was known to be irascible and belligerent in the defense of his points of view and wrote vicious reviews of the books with which he disagreed. Uh, for example, Stephen Gilman's book on the Celestina uh, was shredded by Spitzer in an angry uh, review. Spitzer was more thoroughly grounded in philology and linguistics than Auerbach. He was uh, a philologist and a linguist and uh, uh, spoke uh, many modern languages and knew practically all the classical ones. He was a very, very, very learned man and very brilliant. Spitzer believes that one can get at the core of a work of literature by going from something marginal on the periphery, like a detail, and pursuing it all the way to its center. That a detail can, if properly analyzed, yield a comprehensive interpretation of the work. The geometric metaphors, periphery, circle, center, are a bit, na a bit naive here. We use metaphors in writing theory and in writing uh, criticism, and his uh, are a bit naive when we think about them. Uh, we learned to look for uh, metaphors in criticism in, through the work of the great deconstructionist Paul Deman, who was a professor here at Yale. So, the geometric metaphors are a bit naive, uh, uh, as is Spitzer's emphasis on discovering the personality of the author, or his worldview, his Weltanschauung, to use the uh, German word. He wants to get at the psychology of the author. These are approximations that Michel Foucault, I think I have mentioned him, he's a French philosopher, theoretician, whose most famous book is Le Bon et les Choses, uh, in English translated as The Order of Things. And the first three chapters are on Hispanic things, one on Velazquez, Las Meninas, one on Cervantes, 
and the very first, uh, the beginning is on Borges, the Argentine uh, writer. Um, these are approximations, and Michel Foucault would argue that one limits the possible meanings of a work by reducing it to the alleged intention of its author. If you say, these were the author's intentions, you create kind of a fence around a, a, a work, and uh, uh, there can be no meanings uh, beyond what you assume those intentions uh, uh, to be. Uh, but I believe that what Spitzer is trying to, to find is, is the Cervantian. It's what I call the Cervantian, uh, which to him is a point of confluence between form and content that makes for a coherent, overarching meaning. Since language is, after all, the primary material of a literary work, I believe that Spitzer's work is a good lesson to critics who would leap to hasty interpretations without a detailed knowledge of the text. Now, that language is the is the primary material of a literary work might seem obvious, but it is a, a, a very uh, a, a, a complicated uh, a statement to make because one could say that paint is the, is the uh, primary material of painting and that doesn't get you very far. In the case of, 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 of language, it, I think that it, uh, that it does. Not as far as Spitzer would, uh, would believe, but I think that it does. In the case of the, of the Quixote, Spitzer accomplishes his task by meticulous work on polynomasia. Poly, uh, you have these words in your uh, essay, so I don't, I'm not, I don't have to put them on, on, on the board. Uh, I know that they're uh, jawbreakers, polynomasia, multiple names, and polyetymology, multiple origins of words, meaning multiplicity of, na of names and multiplicity of word origins that are present in these scenes that he analyzes. Spitzer equates the multiplicity implicit in these, in the words, to the perspectivism inherent in the interplay of varied views in the novel by various characters. Various characters have various different point of view, and this is reflected in the, in the, in the multiplicity of, etym of etymologies and in the multiplicity of names uh, uh, given to characters and to things. The differences of opinion among uh, the characters is evinced through the, uh, through the use of language. The key term uh, in the novel is the portmanteau word Sancho uses to mediate in the dispute about the barber's basing, the basillelmo, or the basing helmet in English, by which he attempts to convey the conflicted points of view about the object, according to Webster, a portmanteau word, and uh, James Joyce was famous for making them up, uh, is a word that is a combination of two other words in form and meaning, like the word smug, which is a combination of smoke and fog. I bet you didn't know that. Smoke and fog give you smog, and that is a portmanteau word. Uh, Joyce uses, uses, uh, uses them uh, um, in funny ways. Uh, a passenger in, in Joyce is the pas encore, which in French, me French means not yet. Of course, a passenger is a pas encore because he hasn't gotten there yet, and this is the kind of thing that Joyce does. Um, so that's a portmanteau word, and a basillelmo Basing helmet is a portmanteau word. And you remember that uh, Spitzer makes uh, quite a bit of that. Uh, but, Spitzer, but Spitzer argues uh, behind this multiplicity that is Cervantes, the creator of this whole artistic machine. He stands over all the games of authorship and all of the ironies. That is, you can, you can, uh, you can think of it as uh, Cervantes, and then all of the polynomia and all of the polyetymology and all that, but they are contained in this uh, uh, figure of Cervantes, the author who is the author, who is the author of all the ironies and all of these uh, uh, games. Cervantes, Spitzer argues, is no relativist when it comes to morals. We saw this already. And perspectivism and, ir and irony are inherent in a Christian position which is humble by definition, meaning I don't know enough, like I never know enough to, to. 
Behind Cervantes, the creator, there is God, whom Cervantes never denies. So, so there will be God above Cervantes. Spitzer provides a convincing historical scheme. During the Middle Ages, there is a correspondence between word and things, names and characters. And this is uh, so in the readings of scripture. In the Renaissance, there is a word world, a world of words, to use my own portmanteau word. A world of words, one connecting or leading to the next by metonymy, and a world book, a world made up of books, like Alonso Quijanos, who as a result becomes Don Quixote by inhabiting that book world, or the world of books. In the Baroque, there is a phantasmagoria of words that are like dreams and reveal the deceit of the world, including that of language. Here, uh, in this world uh, of desengaño, is where we find Cervantes, particularly the Cervantes of 1615. So, uh, I put these things on the board because I'd like you to have clear ideas. So, Middle Ages, Renaissance, and Baroque. Correspondence, word things, words to words, and then words who are deceitful uh, and uh, 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 purveyors of engaño, and then leading to desengaño. Now, I am very um, uh, interested because uh, I think it is useful for us as readers and as uh, students of literature, in the Cervantean, according uh, to Auerbach and Spitzer. Uh, to me, the most interesting part of Auerbach's essay is ultimately when he tries to define the Cervantean, lo Cervantino, which can be compared with uh, Spitzer's effort to come to a similar overall view. Theor theor theoreticians and critics can say that there is no such thing as a Cervantian, uh, yet there is. There is a, you know, if you have read the Quixote and you know literary history, you know what is, what belongs to a Cer the Cervantes world. Uh, it's a, a, a great writer creates a world of, of his or her own. It's, it's a set of plots, ideas, tropes, uh, that has some coherence and that can be uh, identified. If you have read Proust, uh, you know what I mean. If you read one Proustian sentence, these long, flowing sentences, and you know immediately you're reading uh, Proust. You read a sentence by Borges with this refined irony, and you know you're reading uh, uh, Borges. Or you read Years later, before the firing squad, Colonel Aureliano Buendia was to remember that remote afternoon when his grandfather took him to, to see ice. Or I'm trying to, this is the beginning of 100 years of solitude, and you know. Now, Auerbach, in defining the Cervantian, begins by giving up. He says, the peculiarly Cervantian cannot be described in words. He begins by giving up. But then he says, First of all, it is something spontaneously sensory, a vigorous capacity for the vivid visualization of very different people in very varied situations, for the vivid realization and expression of what thoughts enter their minds, what emotions fill their hearts, and what words come to their lips. You have to remember that these quotes from Auerbach uh, were originally written in German, and German uh, prose is very complicated and it shows in the translation. Later he says, and just as sensory is his capacity, Cervantes is, to think up or hit upon ever new combinations of people and events. He's, I think he's right when he says something like that. He goes back, uh, uh, our back, goes back to the idea of the mad gentleman running into people. Uh, and he says, what attracted Cervantes was the possibility uh, this formula offered for multifariousness 
and effects of perspective, the mixture of the fanciful and everyday elements in the subject, is malleability, elasticity, adaptability." Unquote. He finally proclaims the following. The Cervantian is an attitude, an attitude towards the world and hence also toward the subject matter of his art, in which bravery and equanimity play a major part. Together with the delight he takes in the multifariousness of his sensory play, there is in him a certain southern, here meaning southern European, not Faulknerian south, no? Uh, there is in him a certain southern reticence and pride. This prevents him from taking the play very seriously. He looks at it, he shapes it, he finds it diverting. It is also intended to afford the reader refined intellectual diversion. Unquote. He goes back over this. He says, the theme of the mad country gentleman who undertakes to revive knight errantry gave Cervantes an opportunity to present the world as play in that spirit of multiple perspective, non-judging and even non-questioning neutrality, which is a brave form of wisdom. There is something, I think, also uh, quite perceptive there. Uh, that is, Cervantes is like a puppet master, like uh, Master uh, uh, Pedro in, in, in the episode you're uh, we're about to read, uh, and he presents all of these many different characters who, uh, in action and sort of stands back without passing uh, judgment. Now, Spitzer, on the other hand, uh, uh, concludes the following. This means that in our novel, things are represented not for what they are in themselves, but only as things spoken about or thought about. And this involves breaking the narrative presentation into two points of view. There can be no certainty about the unbroken reality of events. The only unquestionable truth on which the reader may depend is the will of the artist who chose to break up a multivalent valent reality into different perspectives. In other words, perspectivism suggests the existence of an Archimedean principle, something on which the whole thing rests, uh, outside the plot, an Archimedean principle outside the plot. He goes on, and the Archimedes must be Cervantes himself, unquote. And one more quote, and we may see in Cervantes' twofold treatment of the problem of nicknames, polynomasia, another example of this Baroque attitude. What is true? What is a dream? This time toward language, language itself. Is not human language also a vanitas vanitatum, vanity of vanities, what I was saying about the, in the Baroque, the language is a phantasmagoria. This is the end uh, of, 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 of uh, Spitzer uh, synthesis, his, uh, his conclusion after this very thorough uh, and brilliant analysis of, uh, of the novel. This is my view, uh, I have been expressing it already, uh, this is my view, bo view both on, our, uh, on Auerbach and Spitzer. In the glorification of the author, Spitzer does not take into account Cervantes' errors, his famous oversights which bespeak of a flawed creator, not godlike in any sense, hence pushing the whole issue of point of view to the edge of the abyss of mad abyss, I'm sorry, of the abyss of madness. Since the final authority is is, is flawed. Um, moreover, Cervantes plays so much with the author's lack of authority that one has finally to take him at face value and agree that not even he has authority, uh, the final authority uh, of the book that we read. And I think this he would have agreed with, uh, and we have seen it in, many, uh, in, the, in our readings of many uh, passages. The same is true for our back. Uh, my answer, as you will see in my essays, is hines, cross-eyedness. Remember that Hines is a figure of the author and a figure of the modern author. He has pawned his book, he wants to make money from it, he's from the lower classes. And his cross-eyedness reveals that there is perspectivism from within an assumed single self. That is that 
this, this, this figure of the author here uh, cannot be in possession of the truth because being cross-eyed, I don't know if I can make him enough cross-eyed here, his view of, of reality is flawed and conflictive. Conflictive because there are two eyes, not a single point of view. And, and, and this author figure being cross-eyed makes literally that, he has, that his two eyes means two different visions. We will talk about that when we talk about the puppet play uh, that Ginés de Basamonte puts on here in part two. Um, so uh, the author is multiple within himself. His eyes uh, work independently of each other, as it were. He is congenitally incapable of providing a single point of view. Now we turn to the assigned episodes uh, in the Quixote. As we turn to these episodes, uh, let me remind you that I will be looking into how much each resembles an episode in part one. To what extent these episodes are rewritings of others that have already taken place in the first book. Also, we will see that a, a running thread through these episodes is doubling, the appearance of doubles. Uh, of Don Quixote, of reflections of Don Quixote. Uh, the first is the episode that is called in Jarvis uh, the episode of the Night of the Looking Glasses, which makes it very awkward for me to say because, of course, this is 18th century England, English, and the English say looking glass for a mirror. And uh, so uh, I'm, I say Night of the Looking Glasses just to be consistent with the translation that you're reading this time around, but it's in Spanish, Caballero de los Espejos, Night of the Mirrors. Now, this episode brings to mind that of the fight of Don Quixote with the Basque in part one, because you do have an actual uh, duel. The most significant episode uh, the most significant aspect of this episode is that in it Don Quixote meets, meets his mirror Im image and defeats that mirror image. Carrasco has decided that the only way to subject Don Quixote is to meet him at his own level. But mostly what he's doing is reenacting part one in the way that Don Quixote reenacted or re and still reenacts the romances of chivalry. Don Quixote will fight a copy of himself, modeled after his own mad inventions, a copy that is rich in details. Notice that Dulcinea here is Casildea de Vandalia. Vandalia means Andalusia, land of Vandals. The Vandals were one of the Germanic tribes that uh, invaded the peninsula uh, after the collapse uh, or with the collapse of the Roman Empire. Carrasco, Carrasco's get up as a knight errant is quite something. He has outdone Don Quixote. And here is a quote from page 554. Don Quixote viewed his antagonist and found he had his helmet on and the beaver down, down so that he could not see his face. But he observed him to be a strong made man and not very tall. Over his armor he wore a kind of surcoat, surtout or loose coat, seemingly of the finest gold, besprinkled with sundry little moons of resplendent looking glass, which made a most gallant and splendid show. A great number of green, yellow, and white feathers waved about his helmet." Unquote. This translation, or the translation, struggles uh, a bit with the lunas, the word used in, uh, for mirrors in the original. Muchas lunas de resplandecientes espejos. Which contains that word. Uh, um, a most uh, important suggestion in the passage, la luna del espejo is the reflecting part of the mirror. 
But luna means moon, of course. And moon leads to lunacy, to madness. Sansong is the night of the moons, the night of lunacy, the night of madness, which is quite appropriate because in trying to cure Don Quixote's madness, he's acting like a madman, like a lunatic. The moon, of course, is also the celestial body of reflected light by excellence, the same as the night of the looking glasses, Sansong in this getup, is a reflection of Don Quixote. If Don Quixote came close enough to Sansong, he would be able to see himself reflected on the little mirrors. As in the episode of the Parliament of Death, Don Quixote has met a mirror image of his madness here. It's a more than just a reflection, that is, he's reflected in the, in the night of the moon, who's acting like him, and he's also reflected in his armor, being reflected back from those little uh, mirrors on his, uh, on his costume. So you can see. Sancho has also met his double in Tomé Cecial, whose false nose is a prodigious example of the grotesque which is such a, a prevalent quality in part two. S I quote, scarcely had the clearness of the day given opportunity to see and distinguish objects when the first thing that presented itself to Sancho's eyes was the squire of the wood nose, which was so large that it almost overshadowed his whole body. In a word, it is said to have been of an excessive size, hawked in the middle, and full of warts and carbuncles of the color of a mulberry, and hanging two fingers' breadth below his mouth. The size, the color of the carbuncle, carbuncles, and the crookedness so disfigured his face that Sancho, at, at, at sight thereof, began to tremble hand and foot like a child in a fit, and resolved within himself to take two hundred cuffs before his color should awaken to encounter that hobgoblin. I mean, he says, he, was, he, he may have thought that he had to fight this fellow as his, the, their two masters would fight, and he's saying, after seeing that nose, I would never, never fight this monster. Notice the exaggerated dimensions and utter hideousness of the nose, which together with its being artificial are new features of part two. Maritornes was naturally ugly, and though her physical deformities were extreme, they were at least her own, and not likely to inspire fear so much as repulsion. But here Sancho is moved to dread, which will happen often in part two. Fear is one of the emotions uh, that we encounter once and again in part two, and you can begin charting them from now on. Tomé Cecial's nose is connected to the aesthetics of the Baroque, whose emblematic figure is the monster, a figure made up of disparate conflicting elements, like the nose, and contrived to cause admiration. The monster is made to be shown, and, uh, and uh, this quality is embedded in the very etymology of the word monster, monstratum in Latin. If Don Quixote has met in the night of the looking glasses an image of his madness, in Tomé Cecial, Sancho has met an image of his foolishness. Tomé is like a carnival figure of the fool, and his costume is reminiscent of those of the actors in the wagon of the Parliament of Death. His name is a pun, Tomé Cecial. Mm -hmm. Tomé, of course, is a, is, is, is a form of Tomás, Thomas. Okay, but Cecial at the time meant a kind of trout. So Tomé being the past, his name mean, means I ate trout. If you stop back and think of it, there are many names that mean something, and you don't catch on to it until you think about it. But this is uh, scholars have come up uh, with identifying that Tomé Cecial meant I ate trout. Uh, now, the fact that, that Tomé is an image of, of, of Sancho's fool, foolishness is so much so because Tomé is Sancho's neighbor. 
his equal, with whom Sancho discourses on things proper to squires and whose gluttony and other habits he shares. Their dialogue about the contingency of meaning in language, uh, centering on hijo de puta or whore son, is hilarious, but bespeaks of a very modern conception of language, as Spitzer mentions somewhere in his essay. That is, meaning is contingent in language. It is not fixed. It is shifting. And this is consistent with the, the view of the Middle Ages, Renaissance, and Baroque. In the Baroque, this, the shiftiness of language is emphasized. Uh, so, in the dialogue of the squires, there is also a critique of the upper classes, a frequent topic in part two that you might also chart as you read it. They, particularly Sancho, do not accept the codes of chivalry that, leads, that lead to such uh, uh, fights. Uh, Sancho seems to be saying that it is the upper classes that start wars, a very deep critique. This is part of the political element uh, of the second book of the 1615 Quixote. Uh, but also fits in with the thematics of the desengaño, because uh, the accoutrements of the upper classes, their luxuries, are part of the deceits that are undone by desengaño, as you will see as you move through the upper classes in the next few episodes. Now, what is the significance of all this doubling? Don Quixote means double, Sancho means double. I think that at the, at the deepest level, it means that the characters have met themselves and struggled each within himself to find meaning and identity, or identity within meaning, or uh, a form of, of, of wise uh, self-recognition, troubled self-recognition. This is tied to the issue of self-reflexivity that we have been discussing since the beginning. If the Renaissance mind, if the mind of the Renaissance, if I may use an abstraction, sallies forth in search of the real world, which it tries to interpret, control, and use, the Baroque mind in that sallying forth finds mostly itself. It finds its own inner workings. This I equate to Descartes, je pense, uh, donc uh, je suis, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, which is the ultimate truth that Descartes can find. Descartes, 1596-1650, roughly contemporary, a little later than uh, Cervantes. But it is, it is itself, it is a self-recognizable yet disfigured in these images, in need of further and further thought and reflection with the, uh, with the emphasis on reflection on, on uh, like a mirror. It is appropriate then, for these reasons, that the characters should meet distorted images of their own selves or twisted reflections of themselves in their adventures. Sanson Carrasco has fallen into his own trap, while Don Quixote and Sancho have an almost literally out-of-body experience seeing themselves outside of themselves and seeing themselves how they would look to others. This is particularly troubling to, I think, Sancho, but also to Don Quixote, who, as the novel progresses, will find more such uh, instances where uh, reflections of this kind uh, undermine his, uh, his quest. So and so we move on to the episode of the lions, uh, which is reminiscent of that of the galley slaves in part one. The lions, like the prisoners, are prisoners, and they belong to the king. They are also under the supervision of the crown. Finding lions in the middle of Castile is not a common occurrence. So their appearance is another instance of the real conspiring to add to Don Quixote's madness by presenting him with beings and objects that are out of the ordinary. Like the players in the cart, 
lions are object of amuse, of objects of amusement. They're being taken to court so they can be viewed by the people. Uh, amusement and display. They are fit for heroic action, and Don Quixote does act with great courage only to be mocked by the lion that not only acts peacefully, but turns his hindquarters to the knight. Ultimate insult. Heroism is no longer possible under these circumstances. It is a very cruel episode for Don Quixote, but together with the fight with the Knight of the Looking Glasses, these are two victories for Don Quixote, which together with the knowledge that is now in a book, add to his deluded sense of importance and of accomplishments. The characters around him conspire to increase this delusion. But the lions are real and could have killed Don Quixote and the others. Jorge Luis Borges, whom I have quoted so many times in this course, the great Argentine writer, says that uh, 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 courage is the one characteristic that is a constant from first, from book one to book two, the courage of Don Quixote. And it is also the constant from Alonso Quijano to Don Quixote and back to Alonso Quijano at the end of the book. And so we come to the gentleman in green, the gentleman in the green riding coat. Uh, in Don Diego de Miranda, Don Quixote meets another double, but an inverted one, like a mirror image. Don Diego de Miranda appears to be the Hidalgo Don Quixote would have been, had he not read romances of chivalry, turned mad, and chosen to attempt to revive the age of chivalry. He is, like the Knight of the Looking Glasses, another distorted reflection of Don Quixote, the one, I, I repeat, that he could have been. Don Diego is the image of what the French in the period called the Onetom. He is reasonably well off, reads devotional books, hunts, and lives an honest, peaceful life at home. Don Quixote mocks him. Slightly in the episode of the lions, when Don Diego prudently runs away, and again as he takes his leave, telling him that uh, that he's not Don Quixote says he's not given to leisure, leisure like uh, Don Diego. Uh, Don Diego is a kind of pre bourgeois character, uh, but he has a son who wants to be a poet, Lorenzo de Miranda. We have once again a post prandial conversation, and one more time the discussion center, centers on the relative merits of arms and letters. This is a repetition of that episode. But now in a well-appointed house, not in a dilapidated inn, and Don Quixote has interlocutors who are on his intellectual level. Lorenzo is quite a good poet who reminds us of Crisosto, Grisostomo and Cardenio, but does not take action as they did. Don Quixote reveals that he knows a great deal about poetry. But the outcome of the exchange is that chivalry surpasses poetry, that arms are superior to letters. This whole section seems uh, uh, to be uh, in homage of Garcilaso de la Vega, the great Spanish poet of the 16th century, whose name I've mentioned many times, and who has become by this time the model of poet, courtier, and soldier. Garcilaso, uh, who lived in the first half of the 16th century, uh, died while attempting to scale the wall of a castle during a battle uh, in Charles V's army. They dropped a rock on him. He only lived 36 years, but his poetry changed the course of poetry in Spanish forever. Cervantes was quite devoted to him. The discussion turns to the issue of if a poet can be made or if he's born, and uh, this again gives is another example of Don Quixote's extensive readings, uh, other than uh, of other than merely uh, books of chivalry. Uh, this is the library beyond the library that was burnt by the by the uh, uh, priest and uh, the, the barber and and uh, the women at Don Quixote's house. And then we come to a. Uh, uh, the last episode I'll be discussing today, which is a transition episode to Camacho's wedding. This is the episode of the swordsmen, the two swordsmen who begin to argue about who's better. One is very, very strong, and the other one is an expert, uh, a scientist of, uh, of, of, of fencing. At this time, 
since the advent of firearms and all of that, fencing had become a sport. And uh, not only a sport, but a science. There were books written about uh, trying to understand uh, 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 fencing in geometric and, and mathematical terms. And Cervantes likes to uh, poke fun at this. However, it is the scientific swordsman who, uh, who uh, makes a fool out of the other one who is so strong that at the end, when he's very angry, he takes his sword and throws it so far away that it takes a long time to get out there and, and, and pick it up. The point of this uh, 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 throwaway episode, it may, it may seem, is that uh, it shows that art triumphs over nature, that science triumphs over strength. And the, the triumph of art over nature is a baroque topic that appears once and again throughout part two. And uh, we are going to be talking about that in the next class when we talk about Camacho's wedding in relation to a painting by Velázquez called The Spinners, Las Hilanderas. But now we have to turn, and to conclude, to our exemplary story, The Glass Graduate, which I hope that you have, uh, that you have read. We have gone over the 1613 Exemplary Stories book, how Cervantes uh, published it because publishers became interested in his work after the success of the 1605 Quixote. Also, once he realized that he couldn't use these stories, which he had, uh, in the way he used them in part one because he had been so criticized, and you have read about the criticisms as they appear at the beginning of part two. So uh, Cervantes, who prided himself on being the first to ever write this kind of novella in the Spanish language, collected them in this wonderful book that would have given Cervantes a, 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 a prominent place in the, uh, in, in the canon, even if he had not written the Quixote. Now, The Glass Graduate is one of the better known stories, famous for the very strange kind of madness that afflicts the protagonist. He believes himself to be made of glass and lives in constant fear of being broken. It is another example of Cervantes' profound interest in the workings of the human mind and in issues concerning knowledge and the ability to arrive at the truth. Tomás is a very suggesti suggestive sort of paranoia. It is an illness that has a Kafkaesque air to it. In Kafka's The Metamorphosis, as you know, the protagonist uh, becomes a roach. Tomas suffers a malaise that is expressed through fear of bodily harm, of physical fragility. It is a way of feeling different and vulnerable that can be extended, extended to a general human condition, a form of alienation. I think this is the main reason why the story is so compelling, the idea uh, of this madness that you feel yourself made of glass and therefore vulnerable and you, uh, and you try to establish a distance between you and, and, and the others who might uh, break you or, 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 or anything that uh, a tile falling off a roof might break you and taking laborious uh, 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 measures to, uh, to protect uh, your very vulnerable uh, uh, body. Now. The novel begins as if it were to be a compressed kind of Bildungsromance. That's a German word for word of, for novel of education, Bildung education, Bildungsromance. Uh, but then it moves on to encompass Thomas's entire life. It is not, however, a biography, but it centers on two or three periods of his life, most particularly on the one during his illness. The plot is circular. And uh, circularity is expressed through Thomas's very last name. First, he's called Rodaja. His last name is Rodaja, uh, which means slice. Rodaja is a slice, or not quite a circle, uh, a fragment of a sphere. But when he, at the end, when he recovers from his illness and is in full command of his faculties, his last name becomes Rueda, which means wheel. So he has been completed. We go back to Spitzer and his poly, 
nomatia. Um, now, during his illness, he is known as the Licenciado Vidriera, which is the name of the story in Spanish, which means the licentiate the li uh, licentiate glass window. They call him graduate glass in the translation, but vidriera means a glass window, a stained glass window, or a glass display case. So this is what his name, his names uh, uh, is. Again, go back, we have to go back to Spitzer and names and things and so forth. Uh, there is something passive about Tomas, except when he's ill, but on the whole things happen to him. He's found lying down under some trees by the young gentlemen who take him to Salamanca. He's in their, uh, uh, in, in the, their servant for eight years, but also acquires an education showing a remarkable intelligence, though he's only, uh, this is only reported, not dramatized, until he's ill. He is uh, always in a second plane, as it were. As a soldier, he moves around, trying to soak up as much experience and culture as possible. Tomás is then administered uh, a poison by the spurned woman. Spurned woman who is no courtly damsel, but a notorious whore who falls in love with him. The poison quince preserve, membrillo, that uh, she gives him is redolent with sexual connotations. As in Latin, in the, in, in, in the, in the classics, the membrillo the, in the original Latin uh, was associated uh, by way of resemblance uh, with uh, female sexual organs. This is how she lures him into eating it, but there is no hint of what makes him attractive to her, other than perhaps his fame as a brilliant scholar. It seems like a whim that she falls in love with him. She disappears, and that is as far as the erotic theme goes in the story. It disappears. When ill, Tomas displays a remarkable intelligence and wit being not only insightful in his observations, but making these with puns, sharp witticisms, and clever circumlocutions. He is oracular, like an, he's like an oracle, and is consulted as such by people. There is a correlation between his illness and his insightfulness, which seems to hinge on transparency, since he believes himself to be made of glass. And if you go to page 113, you will find a quote in which uh, uh, he says, uh, he, he, he challenges them to ask him questions that he would be able to answer for, uh, uh, but because he was a man of glass rather than flesh, I'm quoting, for since glass was a fine and a delicate substance, his mind could function more quickly and efficiently in that in a conventional body uh, which was made of uh, denser and earthlier stuff. I mean, his, his body would be denser and glass is transparent and so forth. This is uh, page 113. Uh, in other words, Thomas' mind makes transparent the world around him, just as his body is presumably transparent. Transparency gives him access to the truth. But he's also said to be highly educated and intelligent. So his in insightfulness, once he's ill, is like an increase of these qualities. Or is it disconnected from it? It is not clear if, if it was uh, the poison or the precarious condition in which he believes to be that sharpens his wit. He is like the black man in the traditional story who can tell the emperor that he's naked because he has nothing to lose. Uh, because. Thomas, because of his illness, has become a sort of, of, of freak. He has no reputation to protect. Uh, and so he pierces through all social convention and through hypocrisy and lies and tells the truth. Uh, he also, uh, in uh, outlining the various virtues and defects uh, of each of uh, uh, profession or trade, is following a traditional formula, uh, a set uh, 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 a set piece that became a skit in the theater too. Someone who tells, well, monks do this and cobblers do that and that, that, that is behind this story. Now, the, the glass graduate has much in common with the Quixote and seems to dramatize the common debate uh, in that book between arms and, and letters because he's both a soldier and he's a, and a student, a brilliant student at Salamanca, a, a law student. Uh, but whereas Don Quixote is mainly a reader of literature, 
of romances of chivalry above all, Thomas is a legal scholar whose mission is reaching the truth. His quest is more intellectual than literary. So in that sense, uh, he is not quite like Don Quixote. He is different, more philosophical, if, uh, uh, one could say. The ending seems to suggest, uh, as it is uh, throughout uh, the Quixote, the preeminence of arms over letters when he has to escape from Salamanca uh, and goes back to Flanders and has a, a career in the army and ends his life uh, honorably. Now, we'll, we will be looking at other exemplary stories in the near future, and you will be able to experience the variety of plots and narrative experiments that uh, the book contains, and that I think is the reason for, its being, uh, for these stories being called exemplary. They are like a collection of samples or examples of uh, plots and stories.